Good afternoon, or good evening. Greetings of the day wherever you're dialing in from. I'm Divik, the past chair of BTSYM, and today I've got the pleasure to welcome you to yet again joint lecture that we have lined up for the day. Um, I have lost track of the countless uh, joint lectures uh, the BTSYM and TAIYM have um, delivered over the course of past two uh, two years, um, but I'm quite um, thankful uh, to TAIYM for sort of carrying on um, this continued um, collaboration with us. And today, it also gives me the pleasure to welcome uh, the current chair of TAIYM, Ayush, uh, to introduce our two speakers for the day. So over to you, Ayush. Forces of Indian Army and, his, and has his master's in rock mechanics and underground structures. He has been instrumental in monitoring the tunneling projects in high altitude, almost 10,000 feet above sea level, under inclement weather and cold climatic condition. Presently, he is uh, looking after uh, Atal Tunnel and also involved in preparation of DPRs of various projects. Uh, next, I would like to uh, welcome Mr. Sandeep Nirmal, uh, an active member of not only TYM but also ITA, ITAYM, BTS, YM. He is the past chair of TYM and finalist of ITA Young Tunnel Award. He holds a master's degree in tunneling and underground space. He was involved in various projects like Crossrails, Thames Tideway, Mumbai Metro, Delhi Metro, etc. Presently with rights, he is currently involved with design of about more than 80 tunnels in India and in international projects. Uh, I would also like to welcome Mr. Ahmed Saz, an active member of TYM, who has his master's degree in rock mechanics and underground structure. After designing various metro tunnels, he is presently associated with rights and involved in various high altitude tunnel passes in Ladakh and other Himalayan areas. So, uh, welcome you guys, and now I would like to uh, hand over it to Sandeep and Lieutenant Colonel Sunny and Ahmed Saz for this wonderful presentation. Okay, uh, thank you, Ayush. Uh, after that detailed uh, introduction, I would uh, mention that uh, it's, it's really great uh, to be here uh, and to share a platform with TAI, YM, and BTS YM. Uh, thank you guys for all that. Uh, without now, uh, I'll directly come to the presentation. It's pertinent to mention that we take immense pride uh, in presenting today in front of this August gathering. Without further ado, I'll start with the presentation. Coming down to the Chinkula Tunnel Project, it's a national strategic project which will provide round the year connectivity to far-flung areas of our country, as I am from India, and representing Border Roads Organization, which is putting all out efforts uh, in, in, in a mission mode to complete this project. And equal uh, efforts are being put by uh, rights uh, with a joint venture with GeoConsult in achieving the, um, I would say, target by providing the draft project report well in advance at this time so that uh, all the targets are met. Now, uh, I request Mr. Ahmed Shahs uh, to continue with his part. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Sunny, sir. Uh, uh, Sandeep, can we uh, go, uh, go to the next slide? Yeah, my name is Ahmed Shahz. Uh, I'm uh, part of Rights uh, Limited, and uh, we have uh, we are working on uh, Shinkula Tunnel project. We are making DPR on that. 
apart from shinkula there are many other uh, dpr projects that are coming to the high altitude of uh, 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 himalayan uh, terrains and uh, this is one of the project for which we had recently submitted the dpr that is still in the approval stage there are many constraints we cannot go into the minute details of the project considering the strategic nature and the uh, uh, stage in which it is right now so uh, going to the next slide we can we can have a discussion uh, regarding the experience what we had shared in completing uh, the dpr uh, in a very uh, uh, difficult area very remote area uh, an area where we have only 4 to 5 years of uh, months of effective uh, working season uh, working uh, period in a whole year and uh, we have to complete all the activities that are required to prepare a quality dpr in this particular time only uh, <coughs> So Sandeep, can we move to the next uh, slide? Sandeep, can we go to the next slide? Uh, yeah, Shas, uh, is this visible to you? Because we have moved to the next slide already. No, sorry, it is it is not visible to me. But it is from my end only, or everybody can see. Only I'm not able to see the next slide. Um, I'll, I'll try try to do that again. Just give me a second. Yeah, I'll try yeah. to share it again. Right.
holes causing more than thousand uh, uh, meter of drilling in that area. Then uh, AEM survey was done with Chinook, and Chinook was like the one of the best helicopter possible in that area. And AEM survey is usually done when the area, and especially in the typical type of uh, terrain, when some of the portion is not accessible. So <clears throat> it's a very recent technology, and. Uh, the helicopters they used to come for around uh, 500 kilometers just to have a, 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 a movement on the uh, alignment. And you can get as deep as 600 to 700 meters of uh, uh, geological data. Uh, when that, when that uh, helicopter is moving with the antenna just above 50 meters from the ground surface. So, yeah. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Means only I have to start or Colonel Sunny have to start again. Okay. Now my uh, my voice is clear. Okay. <laughs> Hi everybody. So uh, this project what Colonel Jasani sometime before I just uh, given a brief about it. It's a four kilometer road project uh, uh, in the central Himalayas uh, between tube tunnel and there are cross passages connecting both the tubes. The altitude of the portal around 4,800 meters and the pass the passes on which we were uh, working in that area around uh, 5,000 uh, 5, 100 to 5,300. Some of the tunnels which we're working is like the highest motor rail road in the world, and we are making tunnels in there. So coming back to our this project, the uh, the back of the height of the pass was uh, 5061. Okay, again, something happened. Hello. I'm audible, but I'm not able to see the presentation. So there's some issues from your side. Is it same for you, Devik? Let me share again. But I'm Uh, 300 meters and the site accessibility is uh, three to four months effectively and in that three to four months you have to tackle a lot of difficulties and uh, there are frequent uh, snowfall rainfall and then uh, sometime cloud burst and uh, the trace the, the approach road which will lead you to the tunnel site area sometime got washed away in that working, working month of three and a half months so a uh, lot of challenges we have to face on a daily basis and this tunnel, once once it is made, will shorten the distance from Manali to Leh by around 30 kilometers, and from Manali to Kargil for uh, around 100 kilometers. It is a twin tube tunnel uh, uh, with the unidirectional traffic. So this is a project of uh, high strategic importance and construction tender under process. And can we go to the next slide? Okay, uh, to prepare the quality DPR, uh, we uh, did many pre-construction studies in the uh, site area. Uh, some of the studies I had listed down, these are traffic studies that was carried out and then uh, alignment design was done. There were many options what we had figured out and out of uh, that, that all the alignments, we had uh, selected the best possible one in that area, uh, considering all the constraints, all the, all the mandates, and uh, uh, we had procured the uh, high resolution satellite imagery. And after that, topographic survey was carried out. And uh, for geological uh, thing, 
uh, investigation. We did uh, geological mapping. Our whole team of uh, geologists, senior geologists, and all everybody that just went through the alignment in the remotest possible area, even on the maximum burden, and they did a good job. And uh, after that, the boreholes were planned, and uh, 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 we did an uh, extensive uh, drilling program was carried out. Uh, so that all the boreholes that were required uh, can be completed in the limited time. And we did more than sufficient uh, drilling uh, working day and night in that area. Although it is very difficult to work at night, but somehow we, had, we managed. And uh, the geoph geophysical survey was done uh, by three methods. ERT, SRT was carried out uh, physically on ground. And after that, AM survey was also carried out. AM survey is basically airborne electromagnetic survey that was carried out uh, 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 through an antenna that is basically uh, uh, handled by a helicopter. We used a uh, uh, Chinook helicopter. And these antenna was just uh, taken along the alignment and you can get as deep as 600 to 700 meters of geological data inside the ground. But the only constraint is you have to maintain the distance between the antenna to the ground for around uh, 50 meters. If the distance between antenna and ground will increase, uh, the penetration depth will also increase accordingly. So, uh, apart from that, uh, we did the environmental impact assessment and social impact assessment, all the areas, although there are very, very little settlement nearby. Uh, some villages are having as much as two houses only, <laughs> and that and all the villages are like separated by 15, 20 kilometers of uh, only trace cut. There is no metal road also in that area. And, uh, but still uh, we saw that how they are surviving in that area and uh, what benefits could uh, this project uh, bring to them. And environmental impact assessment was also carried out and the report was submitted. <laughs> Can we go to the uh, another slide, Sandeep? So uh, after the extensive geological investigation, what we did in the area, we had identified around six uh, ground types consisting of quartzite, then phyllitic quartzite, quartzitic phyllite, and uh, uh, upon that six ground types and considering the overburden, around eight type of behavior types were uh, uh, concluded uh, uh, for the design. And uh, according for uh, uh, correspondingly, the excavation and support class are designed. So uh, since it is in, still in tender process, I cannot go uh, deep into the uh, detailed aspect of each thing. This is just a broad thing what uh, uh, we had encountered. The L profile is just, uh, uh, you can see in the presentation, some red lines. These are the shear zones that are encountered uh, uh, just in the middle of the alignment. And uh, we have taken uh, suitable, we had proposed suitable measures uh, uh, that, that need to be taken during construction in that particular area. Deep, can we go to the next slide? So this is a cross section, typical cross section of the dune tubes that are that are being connected with a cross passage, and uh, uh, <coughs> much to say in this, <laughs> not much to say in this. This is just a typical cross section. Site conditions, uh, site condition. Uh, you can see this is June 2020 when we were there on a recce visit. And uh, June in India, if some if you are listening from India, you can imagine how hot June is. But like it is April and 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 heat waves are all along India, especially in the northern and southern part, uh, uh, central and southern part. But in June, when we were standing on Shimpulla, it was totally frozen, and we were not able to ex go to the other side of the uh, uh, the pass uh, with our vehicles. It was totally uh, frozen. The snow cover was high and uh, our vehicle was not able to pass. And uh, <laughs> it was a good experience. Uh, we'll I talk down the line that what experience we had faced uh, when we were there at the site for the first time. Uh, now working in that area for around two, two and a half years, it's been almost uh, three years uh, since I, uh, two, two and a half years when I was working in that area. Now bodies acclimatized some better part, a <laughs> lot of hemoglobin. And so they can we move on to the next slide. So, uh, Sandeep, can you just play this video? This is one of the uh, site visits that we had went to. It, this is also in June, and you can imagine what type of uh, uh, cold and snow and <laughs> uh, uh, difficult uh, part of the world we are living in, we, we, we are working in. And uh, it's 
the road was not accessible, especially in that part. We had to trek to the site uh, area just to get the location of the uh, boreholes and portals and the alignment. So uh, now uh, 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 just uh, I want to share some of the experiences what we had faced uh, while working in that area uh, for more than 22 years. So uh, the working period is very limited. It is around four to five months. Shinkulla, uh, snow cover is high. Some of the other places, some passes, snow cover is less, but uh, temperature is very low. Wing, wings, uh, winds are like biting condition. You cannot stand after four, on the side after four, for four, four thirty o'clock. And uh, since uh, uh, the altitude is very high, it is around 5,000 meters. Uh, so you need to acclimatize. The air pressure is very low in that area. So you cannot just come from the plane and stand in that area without getting acclimatized. It will just uh, you, you collapse. In, in fact, many of our uh, colleagues who hadn't gone into a complete acclimatization process, they came to the site and they just uh, felt very uh, uh, <coughs> unhealthy in that time. And we had to immediately provide them with the uh, oxygen cylinders and then immediately some of the people they were immediately rushed to a safer place and frequent snowfall and rainfall when uh, when i'm telling you that only four months of working that means rest eight months they're totally packed and in that four months also there are so many so many times you will face snowfall and rainfall but since you have to complete the work Otherwise, it is again after eight months, then you have to do anything to complete it, whether it is snowfall, whether it is the rainfall, whether it is cloud burst, whether it is anything. You have to just focus on the activities and how it will be completed in the limited time. Accumulated snow is very, very high. Only three months uh, uh, you will get when the snow, especially on the road and the nearby area is less, but it's still at that time also, the peaks are all totally frozen, glacier bound area nearby. Temperatures are very extreme, as I told you. It will go as low as minus 30 degrees uh, in winter time. And even in summers, the maximum temperature, what you can expect in the daytime is 10 degrees, even less than that. So uh, to tackle all these things, uh, some we, had, we, we did a good planning because you cannot just go and stand, uh, stand that area and start working. So winter clothing, we, we, that's very... Uh, uh, you can say very costly and very uh, uh, thick <clears throat> the clothing we had provided to all the workers irrespective of their categories or designation. Even the laborers, even the supervisors, operators, they were provided with the best quality of winter clothing from uh, our company to work in that area. And uh, icing on the approach road is very common and icing will lead you to, uh, there's a lot of risk of skating of the side vehicles, even. So you have to put chains on the tires every time you are moving, moving uh, to the site location because the roads, uh, once icing is done, icing is uh, had happened on the metal road and you are taking a turn, <laughs> you'll just go down the, uh, the what you studied, uh, your, <coughs> all the forces, on the horizontal direction that will just take you away. And the difficult part was there was no cell phone in the area. So once you got stuck, you cannot uh, uh, call anybody. You cannot uh, call for help if you don't have in Marsif. So uh, we have satellite phone facility and uh, that uh, actually helped us a lot, not only in the safety and evacuation, but also during uh, breakdowns, during uh, uh, many requirements, logistic, logistic requirements, any any type of uh, communication, any type of information that need to be checked, that need to be uh, communicated to the design office. So this is, Sandeep, can we go to the next slide? Remoteness is level of remoteness, means uh, you cannot see anything like 50 kilometers south, 50 kilometers north. Some yaks you can see, and even yak will look at you, that who are these creatures coming in our areas? <laughs> Some horses, wild horses, you can expect 
so but apart from human everything like some very endangered type of species some wild goats some even uh, you can encounter a, a snow leopard also in special in the night time one of our uh, driller he was sleeping in the tent and he had encountered it so in that the very next day we had shifted whole of the things is uh, uh, to a safer place and this happens generally in the winter time when we are like about to close our site and all the top of the mountains are closed totally packed snow capped and these wild animals comes to the valley for having a drinking water so uh, considering all the remoteness there is no logistic shop nearby some 50 kilometers you have to buy diesel once one of the petrol pump it shows you a sign uh, next petrol pump 375 kilometers ahead <laughs> so just imagine the remoteness that a lack of planning can lead to disaster because you cannot afford uh, lose time in that in this area because once if you are not completed then again after 8 months and this is just too much time so uh, the planning part uh, especially completing all the activities in a very limited time is very important and we did it uh, uh, for every thing uh, 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 starting with the site mobilization and then the breakdown of the machine the supply of logistics uh, the uh, circulation of informations and uh, the supply of diesel uninterrupted uh, supply of uh, uh, man, so, uh, man resources human resources and everything need to be planned some of the example i will i can tell that the market the closest big market is around you can say 150 200 kilometers away where you can get spare parts of the machine if it is if it has a breakdown so uh, you cannot afford to send a team from the site location to that area and then that machine will uh, uh, rectify that part and then come back again you cannot afford that so once one team one of your team will be sitting at that market place and one message they got that okay this part uh, is uh, failing immediately they will purchase it and will send back to the site so within a minimum time you will get it repaired this is how it is then again uh, 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 because the area was very difficult many a time it happens that people used to get uh, uh, stuck in a snowfall so uh, our one of our team they used to be ready at every by around 8 8:30 9 o'clock and they used to wait with all the people they came back uh, to our guest house which was there like around uh, 70 80 kilometers uh, south of the uh, project uh if it, they are not there at the guest house uh, uh by 9 o'clock then evacuation team was sent immediately to get them or to find them or to see whether what uh, problems they are facing and uh, many of a brief brief fellas uh, uh, they started uh, staying on the site in spite of the extremely harsh condition just to meet the deadlines and that was uh, uh, when the site was about to close wild animals risk was definitely there oxygen was very low uh, at uh, temperature was uh, very low and uh, 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 pressure was very low so all combined low things <laughs> got together and since oxygen was low you will feel difficulty in breathing and at the time we were working in this area it was covid in uh, covid scenario so many times you get confused okay whether it is due to lack of oxygen or <laughs> whether you got affected with covid so this type of dilemma every time it used to come with everybody <laughs> who is working on that area so you have to pump some oxygen <laughs> on a daily basis you have to provide big big uh, safety uh, uh, measures and uh, 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 this is how it is done <clears throat> uh, going to the next slide these are the logistic issues uh, what we have faced now coming to the technical challenges uh, the area was uh, not accessible when the main approach road itself was under construction when we started working that area so uh, uh, to uh, uh, send our machine to uh, to a location good for drilling we many a time we have to make uh, make uh, approach roads roads and these approach roads are sometimes as long as 4 kilometers 3 kilometers for some of the projects shinkula fortunately not that much approach road was required but still if you accumulate a uh, 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 add all the approach roads was around more than a kilometer of approach road, or even more than that. What we had made just to uh, drag our machines, heavy machines, all the equipments to the drilling locations and start drilling to the right place. So uh, trace cut was difficult. You have to keep working, making of platforms, 
and these are time taking time consuming activities many a times you tray skirts nicely built after some snowfall some rainfall they got washed away and again you have to do rework in that area so rework is a very natural very uh, a common thing we everybody uh, in the team are like peace with the rework in that area everybody knows that rework is a very natural thing you have to do it machine if I'll just ask Shaz. Maybe he's not connected. <clears throat> Or Derek, do you want me to continue until he joins? Let me know when I can uh, go ahead with 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 the presentation. uh so uh well shaz was the best person to describe all his experiences which he had on the site for these pre construction studies but i think uh he is actually on site right now and uh the network is usually not very good uh probably he is just cut off uh i'm hoping to tell his story through his own uh words and he joins us back again until then i'll just carry on uh so we when we uh, were doing pre construction work on the site as shaz has already told uh, that not just uh, not just doing the work but to enable uh, for workers to do it and to uh, make all the arrangements uh, for the machinery and the logistics to be there for doing that work was uh, a big challenge in itself so if we could if we can see uh, that every day when we came to site in the morning um, so we had to travel about 50 to 60 kilometers one way and okay, um, okay. which was the nearest uh, which which was the uh, nearest okay. town sandeep can can i start ah uh, yeah shaz you're back yes <laughs> Sorry, I, I didn't. I, <laughs> I was. I, don't I was know just. What I was. I yeah. was just. I uh, was just sharing that how reaching mm. the site every day was difficult, and yeah. how when yeah. every day when we came when we came to the site, we found yeah. frozen water, uh, yeah. and to just to start working, it was very difficult. Yeah. Uh, to uh, melt it first and then start working every yeah. day, it was a process for. Mm. Uh, so you can you can go ahead and uh, yeah. tell your story yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so i was telling about low machine efficiency so we were actually working with 60% of efficiency so <laughs> you can expect that uh, for that reduce 40% we had to put our effort <laughs> more than 40% uh, to just balance uh, the progress and uh, the high wear and tear was very high uh, because of n number of reasons and uh, the same thing that we had to uh, ready our team at our at this uh, 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 market location so that the wear and tear thing could be repaired as soon as possible our satellite phone had worked a lot in this freezing of diesel just imagine was a very uh, common phenomena especially uh, when we are close to uh, completing our site so we used to get uh, procure some uh, diesel capsules that we used to put in the diesels and because of that the diesel never uh, freeze if you don't have these capsules then what sandeep was telling <laughs> again every every morning your day start with putting some fire below the machine so that this uh, all the uh, frozen diesel that will melt away and you can start with the progress and that will just consume one and a half hours of a very comfortable morning <laughs> uh, of yours because after four or three years sometimes three o'clock you can't stand on the site it's uh, uh, chilling cold especially uh, when uh, uh, after october even after uh, uh, mid september you can say non availability of water for working is also a big big issue uh, you can see the photographs all the pits all the uh, 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 this tanks in which we used to store water they all just get frozen you need to have some uh, 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 source of water if you don't have then 
only option is you have to fill tankers uh, at a from a place which is at a, a, a lower altitude even it let it be some 50 60 70 kilometers away but you have to fill it and then you have to take that a tanker on a daily basis to uh, uh, your site so uh, fortunately in shunkula we have some uh, streams but in october when we were working these streams all got, got frozen the pits the tanks all got frozen so <laughs> uh, uh, that was very difficult to work in other projects uh, we are using uh, tankers from day one because there are no uh, water channels uh, on the top of the mountains so uh, going to the next slide these are some of the a few technical challenges uh, 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 what uh, i just uh, shared with you but our team like every single day there is some 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 big thing that happened on the site for example some one day it happened that whole cloud burst happened and whole of the road main road that got washed away so like a whole team who were there in the guest house they remained in the guest house who were there at the site they have to take a different guest house for till the time that uh, road was under repair repairing so uh, uh, then again some some uh, health issues keep on happening uh, to the people who are working uh, uh, very common phenomena is nausea some breathlessness and especially when you're working to, to in that high altitude and you have to lift something you have to put some physical effort on some activity you cannot imagine what will happen to you you will just uh, a breathlessness uh, uh, suffer breathlessness to the maximum possible limits and uh, going to the next slide so these are some of the photographs of the site many of times your uh, vehicle will not able to reach the site location and believe me at that but height of 5000 meter altitude you have to trek literally for around kilometers means for as, many, as 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 much as 10 kilometers you, you have to go and 10 kilometers you have to come back crossing all the water stream having water as cold as ice you cannot put your foot in that cold water for more than 30 seconds but you have to because there's no other option and you have to get into it and then come out so uh, these type of things then evacuation mobilization sometimes it is good because you are mobilizing it when the snow is like about to go but demobilization itself is a big challenge because you have to finish the work and you have to ensure that all your machineries all your equipments all your resources they are uh, uh, safely back to the uh, com comparatively lower elevation uh, in the time when the area is not packed Colonel Sunny can <laughs> understand <laughs> the difficulty of this area. Some of our people got stuck also, in the, and, and like Colonel Sunny and his team, they had helped us a lot in getting that people yes. out of yeah. uh, uh, out of uh, the very difficult situation. And with the help of whole administration, and we totally obliged to them. It was around Thank two you. in the night. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Then uh, uh, going to the next slide. these are some of the pics uh, uh, when this uh, cloud burst happened uh, 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 this type of <laughs> scenario you can imagine uh, this is the main road main highway on which this uh, jcb is uh, uh, standing and just imagine if the condition of highway is that in the, what will happen to our trace cut that is matlab ke the time t is equal to zero it is in perfect condition <laughs> so just imagine with this type of this type of things are happening so how difficult it is to for the site team uh, to move to the uh, site and uh, do their regular activities and many a times you go to the site and whole night it was uh, uh, raining and snowfall and most of the equipment everything will be submerged in snow and then you have to identify that okay where is our machine then you will wait for the sun to come up or you have to physically remove all the snow and then again start the activity one of the photos in night you can see that is our de nuclearization uh, uh, process that is going on uh, we were uh, intimated by this uh, department uh, meteorological department that uh, uh, just next day uh, snowfall will happen to the site snowfall will give you three warnings one will happen in september or october second mid october and third like november starting and after three uh, uh, third warning it will be closed totally 
and uh, the next time it will open it will it will be like 7 8 month gone so we got last warning that please remove all your machine and all everything otherwise tomorrow uh, uh, snowfall is going to happen and all your machines will be submerged under big 5 to 10 meters of snow uh, for this whole season so day and night we worked and just we got all the machine out uh, from this site area and exactly what happened next day snowfall happened and everything got back but all of our machines everything got evacuated in the right possible time uh, this this time when we were evacuating it was around uh, uh, 10 o'clock in the night what i remember and uh, the temperature if i remember it was below minus 25 for chilling cold in that area and uh, it was 15th of uh, November 2020. So, <laughs> but still, we got uh, 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 all of our things uh, evacuated. So, uh, going to the next slide. These are some of the pics of the AEM survey what we had carried out uh, in one of the uh, project. Uh, uh, this Chinook hel helicopter uh, what we had hired, and this helicopter used to take our antenna throughout the alignment. Uh, these some alignments. These are like very difficult to access the all the over buttons are more than a kilometer uh, uh, high and physically it is not possible for any person to go and climb these high altitude mountains and uh, do any type of survey whether it is drilling whether it is uh, uh, ERT, SRT, geophysical survey the only option you are left with is AM survey and uh, uh, it's a difficult thing but somehow it is done it has also been done in many of many of our projects uh, some of the pics uh, right now shows our tents at the uh, uh, site location, some drilling, uh, uh, live drilling happening on the site and uh, the prevailing site conditions in which uh, for you it might be difficult, but when you are working on a daily basis in that area, <laughs> it is a new normal to you. You feel like, okay, today you can see a bit of sky, clear sky, so everything is good. <laughs> because seeing clear sky especially in shipkula type of area is a rare phenomenon there are always clouds there are always uh, some uh, <laughs> clouds either are there or they are seems to come or they are coming but like it is all always come come valley condition so uh, going to the next slide yeah so skating, uh, we had also hired some uh, snow scooters also. Uh, at, there was a, a time uh, came when our all the our site vehicles uh, were not able to go to the site locations. And our trace cut uh, was around seven to eight kilometers uh, 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 long. So it was very difficult, especially when you have a very limited squeezed out time of around four to five hours per day of working. And a team is like taking one hour of moving and one, one hour coming back. So you cannot afford that because for three hours, your progress will be like minimal. So uh, we had hired some snow scooters to tackle the thing, to tackle the icing thing, and then take all your uh, team to the site location and uh, continue the process. Some happy moments when all your uh, efforts paid and you get uh, a core as long as three meters. <laughs> so all your efforts, whatever you are putting in, that just cannot imagine what type of happiness a person from down from very lowest look to the topmost level how happy they feel when all your effort all the all your uh, you can say uh, 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 difficult efforts paid off so now uh, uh, i will give the presentation to uh, sandeep and he will take you forward with some challenges expected during construction thank you Thanks. Thank you, Shaz. Thank you for this uh, wonderful experience that you have shared, uh, what you went through by uh, being there on site, by doing all these activities and uh, while uh, providing for all the workers uh, a, a very good environment where they can work uh, in such a difficult situation where you are really uh, cut off from the whole of the world. Uh, you might like to check your mic. Uh, you're on mute, if I'm not wrong. Uh, I'm fine. My, 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 I'm not mute. Uh, am I audible to you? I can. Yeah, oh, yeah, I can. Fine. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. That's, yeah, yeah, that's, that's perfectly.
Okay. Yeah. Is it fine? Shall I go ahead? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, uh, I was just thanking Charles for for uh, managing all the all the pre-construction studies and doing all the work uh, on the site to to gather all the information uh, about this yeah, project. Sir. But one, one, one small thing, Sandeep, uh, if you can just spare me one, five seconds. Yeah, we are going to Yeah, uh, just to conclude with a very big thank to the team, to everybody who was part of uh, uh, the pre-construction activities. And uh, uh, they worked literally very hard, very hard just to deliver the quality DPR in the limited time. So my whole task is just a team effort. It's just a team effort uh, uh, because of which we are able to deliver it. And thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Shaz. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that that was all the effort that was done was to uh, was a first step towards the realization of this project. Uh, these these tunnels which we are building in extreme condition in Himalayas uh, are uh, very strategic in nature. They they have a lot of uh, value in terms of India's defense strategy. And and connecting the uh, land of Ladakh to to the mainland uh, with an easy connectivity throughout the year, so that uh, the tourism that is linked to Ladakh can uh, can flourish. And uh, definitely, these tunnels have a lot of value in terms of uh, bringing economic development in that area, and uh, and 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 to utilize all the uh, barren space at the moment and very beautiful space, to be honest, which has huge potential uh, to develop uh, for uh, as a big tourism industry. Um, so these these tunnels, uh, these tunnels are extreme and uh, and have a, uh, need some specific uh, new ideas to how to do construction in those extreme conditions. So I'll just bring out few of the important aspects from this project. Um, unfortunately, I won't have time to discuss everything, uh, but few important things that I would like to discuss are one of the things is concreting in low temperatures. So when when the design was going on, the very first question was how the concrete will behave in temperatures like minus 20, minus 30 degrees. Um, just just to add that the planning for this project is such in such a way that we have to work 12 months a year. So even if it is minus 20 degrees, minus 30 degrees, snowing for uh, uh, for a long time with a snow cover of about five to seven or 10 meters at mo at, at moment, we still have to work. So uh, to, to enable the contractor uh, and the client, the designers to work to the, for this project to go forward, uh, which is on a very strict timeline, uh, we had to include and consider few technical stuff um, uh, so that we we can we can foresee these challenges and we can find out ways how to go forward. So since the construction on such a large scale has not been done in such low temperatures, uh, it was very difficult to find uh, the specifications of how how the concrete will work in those locations. So we had one of the references from Indian codes, which lays uh, some of the guidelines for that. Uh, but to be honest, in such low temperatures, these has not the, these these things have not been yet tested. But definitely, they will be tested, and there will be a lot more innovations coming out of after this project. So uh, what what happens is uh, when the temperature go beyond. Uh, below five degrees, uh, the uh, since since the cement and water uh, reaction in concrete is a exothermic reaction, we expect that in layer temperatures the rate of reaction would increase, but that does not happen because water starts to crystallize uh, below uh, below these temperatures and it becomes so cool that uh, it's very difficult for the reaction to go forward. So uh, the guidelines say that. Uh, the react the concrete shall always be kept at more than five degrees. In no case, it should go below five degrees. Uh, the uh, rapid hardening cements shall be used in the mixed design. Accelerators shall be added. Uh, cement content shall be high. Uh, they should never be less than 300 kilo kgs per meter cube. 
and uh, when we are storing the water in aggregate in those conditions uh, we know that the concrete will will not will not be able to produce concrete at that low low temperatures so we have to preheat the water in aggregate and uh, the code says that it should not be heated at, at any moment it should not cross 100 degrees although for water the maximum temperature should shall be 66 degrees uh, the temperature and humidity records have to be maintained throughout the project to ensure that the uh, quality control is in place uh, we need air entrainment uh, agents into the concrete i'll in the next slide i'll show why do we need those uh, since this is a this is a location where freezing and thawing is very um, is very common uh, when you are close to surface. So at least for the first hundred meters of the tunnels, we are expecting that the temperatures will be very low. But when we will be inside, when we're drilling inside the uh, hill, it, the tunnel will be a little bit warmer due to construction activities and other stuff, and the uh, the the. Uh, external temperature not affecting the interior regions that much. So uh, the air entrainment in the concrete is quite important. So if I just go to the next slide, I can show you the graphs that how uh, what happens when when the concrete goes through cycles of freezing and thawing. So you can see that uh, as the cycles of freezing and thawing with the concrete increases, the compressive strength can fall to up to one eighth of what it should achieve and the elasticity falls uh, elasticity in the concrete falls very low and it the concrete can become uh, brittle quite easily and it can produce cracks so what 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 happens is we add air entrained agents so that after entering the air entrained agents the concrete has some 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 uh, you know scope for recovering from those uh, contractions and and still uh, maintain its own properties. Uh, then uh, not just production and not just the components that we add in, but transportation of concrete from the batching plant from production to the site is also an issue. So what we need to do is as soon as the concrete is ready, we need to put in the concrete into vehicles. We have to put insulation uh, against those surfaces and transport it as soon as possible. So we have to make sure that the that the concrete shall have uh, uh, the temperature of 10 degrees when it reaches the site of pouring and the temperature shall not fall below five degrees at any cost. Then uh, the concrete mixtures or trucks that are taking the concrete shall be continuously in motion. It should be mixing continuously and the vehicle should not stop in open or cold temperatures. It should go into the tunnel and when the temperatures are fine, then we have some time to to halt them or to, to stay inside the tunnel. So we have what we have planned is we have cross passages. So we will we'll make some space for the vehicles to stand in the tunnel by the time there is there are other um, movements going on parallelly uh, for the construction. So we need a continuous monitoring, a continuous supply chain uh, maintained in with a frame of time so that uh, there is no excess and no shortage at the same time for the whole project. Then uh, again, we have to make sure that we take all the temperatures and humidity uh, status and make a record of them while we are transporting it to make a decision whether we need to use the concrete or not. So uh, with this, with these graphs, we can have a look at how uh, the um, the concrete behaves in low, at low temperatures. So when we when we have poured the concrete, and that the graph on the left side, the smaller graph, shows that if freezing occurs around the concrete, uh, the, uh, the the the, the the, the strength of the concrete reduces to 30 to 50 percent of what it should achieve in a normally moist concrete. So we have to make sure that the uh, strength of the concrete is not compromised. And then again, uh, if we see that uh, there, if there are continuous, the, the concrete is continuously on no, low temperatures for the curing period of concrete, if we are at minus seven degrees, if we leave the concrete at minus seven degrees temperature, then the strength of the concrete goes to 15% of what it should achieve. So we have to make sure that it's not only uh, production of the concrete or transportation of the concrete, but 
during placing of the concrete, it is equally important that uh, we place it and we maintain it for the pure curing period at a particular temperature. So the code provides for the guidelines regarding that as well. It says that we should put the concrete as quickly as possible and insulation should be provided against the concrete surface, against the shutters for it to retain the uh, moisture as well as temperature for as long as possible. And uh, since the uh, gain, the gain in the concrete strength is slower, so we have to make sure that the uh, form work is longer in position. We have to find out with the mixed designs and the trials that how long they should be. We have to put the form work uh, a little bit longer so that it, it gains the strength while we move it. Uh, we have to co cover the concrete with insulation as soon as, as, soon as the form work is moved. Uh, concrete's temperature, as I have already shared, that shall be more than five degrees while placing, and it shall be maintained at least for seven days. Uh, preferably for 28 days, but at least for seven to eight days in that temperature. If required, if the temperature suddenly falls or if we are near the tunnel openings near the surface, then we have to uh, go with the steam heating and to keep it on the temperature that we need. Uh, although the construction is planned to begin in the summer season, so uh, during summers, uh, this, these problems may not be as severe as they will be in winters. So the initial portal locations will be uh, will be casted in place uh, during the summer itself. So it but uh, so but all these factors have to be built in for any anything which comes up in future. Concrete shall never be poured again the frozen subgrade or against the form of co form work covered with snow and ice. Uh, pretty obvious and the. Obviously, the temperature and humidity records have to be taken for, for be kept for throughout the project uh, to maintain the quality of the concrete. And the contractor has to do various trial mixes for finding out the time of demolding, when to do the mixing, what temperatures to do that, how to put it into transportation, when what would be the cycle time, how the uh, mixtures will move, and how how the concrete will be placed. Uh, then for the short treating, uh, they, for the short treat, there are many more things that we uh, we need to, to find out during those uh, trial mixes when the contractor is on the site. We need to see how the setting time of concrete uh, changes in those temperatures. Uh, how is the bonding with the cold surface? What's the rebound? What's the early setting strength? And uh, we have also kept the option of dry short treating. So in case um, in case we cannot produce uh, at some time, we cannot produce the wet wet short treat. What we can do is we can store the aggregate water and cement inside the tunnel in the warmer area where the temperature is uh, relatively higher than outside, and then we can do a dry short treat where everything is mixed in the novel and is put put on the surface itself. Uh, and the contractor has to do various various mix designs for these short treats for sure. It's not only concrete uh, in those temperatures. Maintaining almost everything is very difficult. <laughs> but but uh, apart from concrete, I think the water is also plays a very huge role uh, in this project. Uh, what we have seen from the experiences is in that in this region, uh, if there is a water in the pipe, it just expands and it just breaks <coughs> breaks the pipe. So it is important that insulation against the pipe shall be provided. Heating systems against the pipe shall be provided with running water so that it doesn't freeze. Uh, vacuum suction facilities should be there so that water from the and water in the waste from the pipes can be sucked off so that it does not have the uh, the scope of expansion and further uh, degradation uh, and 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 uh, break or breaking of those pipes and storage uh, drains, and then we need to do regular mon monitoring and maintenance of those drains so that the water doesn't uh, the water doesn't freeze. Then we need to uh, uh, manage the waste as well, as we know that most of the area during winters is covered with snow. So if we just go and dump everything on the snow, when the snow will melt, everything will go into the valley and it will go flush down the valley and uh, will pollute all the environment there and, and will produce uh, many issues like, uh, dis like uh, 
groundwater contamination and surface flow contamination. So what we need to do, uh, what we have done is actually we have planned a, a, a disposal site where we will put all the muck, all the water which is coming and dump it there. During winters, we'll make sure that it is covered, that it doesn't, uh, it doesn't uh, get filled with snow and uh, the dumping is carried on until the winters, which is a difficult time. And when the winters are over, we can again uh, rethink about it, how to manage it further and to prepare for the next season again. So it has to be a continuous pro um, continuous thing to go with. Uh, then again, ventilation. If we talk about ventilation during construction, uh, so if you think about tunneling uh, and sucking the uh, external air and providing it to the face of the tunnel, then that is not a very good option because uh, that air outside itself is very cold. So if you if you put the cold temp your cold air in, your uh, the short feed gain strengths, the concrete gaining strengths, and the people who are working in the tunnel will just freeze and will be very difficult for them to uh, to work in that region. So it it has to be make sure uh, that. Uh, we need we need uh, some heating uh, uh, heating agents into the ventilation system so that the air which enters uh, shall be uh, acceptable technically as well as for, it provides a good environment with the conditions inside for the people who are working there. Uh, what we can uh, what we we can also do is to close the face the portal of the tunnel temporarily with the air barriers so that. Uh, the transfer of air is minimum from the face of the tunnel. So uh, this, these all uh, thing, these all aspects have to be taken into account. As uh, Ahmed Shahs has already told that the uh, experiences that we we have, we have had with the pre-construction studies is what we we have as we have observed that the efficiency of all the machines reduces as we go high on the altitude. So as we go higher, the air pressure reduces. And with reduction in air pressure, the air density reduces, which means for every amount of air that the engine brings in for the consumption, for the combustion, sorry, uh, less amount of oxygen is coming in. And uh, hence the proper uh, combustion is not happening. So uh, we, uh, what we observed is that we we faced about 30 to 40 percent reduction in the efficiency of machines while working there. So what happens is generally uh, for the first 1,000 kilometers above mean sea level, we we don't see any uh, reduction in the efficiency of the machines. But every next 1,000 meters, we see about 10 percent reduction. So uh, since we are working at around 4,500, 5,000 meters. We can expect that it is going to be about 40 to 50 percent. Uh, we have already seen that it was about 30 to 40 percent for us. So more wear and tear of machine, um, less use of fuel, uh, and less less efficiency of machines has to, has been taken into account. The contractor has to, uh, since this project is going to the contractor's bidding for construction, contractor has to take all these risks into account and quote the price accordingly. We uh, then we have to uh, maintain a uh, few supplies, whatever we have, we have to use at the site uh, since roads are almost closed for six months. It's very difficult to, uh, to maintain a transportation to go to the site and come back. Um, and uh, that's why we need to store important stuff on the site itself such as cement, steel, aggregate, water, explosives, food, food for the people, uh, diesel, uh, clothing, so, so much stuff. Everything has to be planned. And we have to assume that all the workers that that are that will be there on the site have to live there. Uh, there should be uh, facilities for that as well. With this, uh, uh, I'll just I'll, I'll not go too much into the design because uh, our presentation was about the challenges that we face uniquely at working at those heights. So I'll just briefly speak about what are the primary and secondary supports that we are proposing in tunnel. So we have a combination of short grade with rock bolts, wire mesh, lattice girders, steel fibers, uh, and and these are varying way as as different support classes as we go through uh, different geology. 
and in secondary lining we are using uh, we are using uh, unreinforced concrete with microfibers uh, and sometimes a combination of microfibers with steel fibers and uh, where we have encountered very pure geology we are using conventional reinforcement mm -hmm. bars uh, and steel fibers with the concrete uh, with this i'll i'll just uh, i would like to try, uh, go to colonel sunny for um, explaining Lieutenant Colonel Sully to explain what what lies ahead for the project. Uh, since he is the client, he would be looking after this project for a longer period of time than us, and uh, he he would be the best person to take over from me. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Sully, please. Yeah, go ahead. Thank uh, thank you, Sandeep. Uh, now I'll take on. After that, uh, quite a session now. Uh, I'll just wrap up all the things uh, quickly. As we all know, that Chinkula is located at an altitude of 5,500 uh, 5, meters above the mean and tell you by working throughout the year now what is happening here is if we if there is any um, any delay uh, at a particular stretch that would have a cascading effect on the entire project because already we are falling short of time we don't have any time to cope up so four to five months we are already so uh, that is very particular here in any uh, project which is at a high altitude area uh, which is a snowbound area and we're working season is very less uh, to avoid any uh, uh, I would say uh, any fatal uh, lapse of time, it is much more uh, relevant to stick to the time schedule uh, very uh, uh, very stringently and uh, to follow it very strongly. Second is uh, maintaining accessibility to the project area, especially in the winter season. Now, what is happening here in this particular project, when we are approaching towards the site, uh, when we are at Shinkula Pass, uh, the entire uh, stretch from Darcha, it is 30 kilometers from Darcha to Shinkula. Now, in this 30 kilometer stretch, we have done a study from a different team or together. We have approximately 10 to 13 Avalon sites. So what is happening is these Avalon sites are activated in the winter season. That restricts our movement towards the site or the project site itself. So that is uh, one very major point. Now it involves heavily employment of resources and manpower, both dedicatedly, which is uh, continuing uh, Avalon sites to maintain the connectivity through the air. That is one point to note down here. Uh, the next is, since it is a high altitude area, a uh, health facility at passes is definitely a question which is uh, there, there is always in mind and it should be always there on the table because the real asset of any organization is the workers and if we can provide the better living condition or I would say a safe living or a safe working environment, then it is, uh, it is on our part. So, uh, now in a high altitude area, uh, as we know, the oxygen is less. So we have few uh, issues coming up. Uh, that is, I'll, I'll highlight few of them. One is the swelling of brain, which is also known as high altitude uh, cerebrum edema. Now it is rare, but it is fatal. Second is swelling of lungs, which is again because of uh, lower intake of oxygen uh, over a long period of time. Uh, that is also known as high altitude pulmonary edema. And then uh, pre-existing medical conditions, uh, they get aggravated uh, once you are there in a high altitude area. So these things need to be uh, taken in consideration. Uh, that brings me uh, to the next, uh, uh, I would say, interrelated point, that is evacuation, which is mainly a descent of that particular individual from the high altitude area and oxygen then we can have oxygen chambers installed there. Now, what is happening is uh, this site. This is one. And uh, then uh, after this, we need an evacuation uh, plan in place so that any eventuality or any exigency, any individual problem. Now, I'll cover all the points. I have so the further points here in the presentation, as you can see, uh, are under the logistics. I would take it under the logistics. The first point is now the workforce. We have around about 400 to 50 people working on, let's say, one attack point or let's say two attack points uh, um, uh, at present or maybe in any project with, with, which is uh, going on. Now, man Managing uh, uh, this 
much of workforce at particular a high altitude area involves firstly their stay the stay is uh, should be closely located to the work site so we have uh, what seekers have brought out uh, very clearly would be cut off for approximately 3 to 4 months in a year so we we need to have that uh, stacking, under stocking of uh, ration in place. So uh, the uh, even if we are planning to give a practical approach, there is a requirement of uh, um, heli in terms of communication. Uh, uh, and and there would be many times when the weather is bad, we don't expect the heli to come, or even the uh, rescue operations are halted because of the bad weather. So we need to be prepared for situations like this. Uh, we need a. Uh, the location as we know that this is a remote location so these problems will definitely there now uh, just for the incident when we consider shinkula uh, the nearest uh, location would be manali from uh, i would say plus 10 15 degrees celsius to minus 30 degrees celsius in winters that is extreme so we need to provide enough uh, heating arrangements uh, so that uh, the uh, uh, the workforce is comfortable and we have provided a uh, working environment uh, in in order to take down the maximum efficiency when we are targeting uh, our uh, Timeline communication has been rightly brought out. Uh, the communication is limited to long range uh, radio sets, which is we, we call it walkie talkies. Uh, uh, as per the intra project communication is a uh, concern in uh, inter project communication that is being done through in mass sets or satellite phones. Uh, there is no other way of communication um, uh, uh, for the work side uh, for the project to the uh, outside world. Electricity is another big challenge in these projects as we all dependent on the gensets for uh, complete electricity and plus being a mechanical equipment as rightly brought out by Sandeep that the efficiency of any equipment lower down by 30 percent or maybe 40 percent in a high altitude area which is almost uh, 5000 meters above uh, the sea level. So uh, that has to be taken care of then the redundancy part comes in. The redundancy is again we don't have any backup so uh, uh, the generator uh, set which is being provided uh, for the electricity is uh, another set of generators for the backup of the main generator sets. That is the redundancy here in this project. Uh, the, 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 the Here a point to note down is the less dense air does not does the effect to be catered in our uh, contingencies. Then I'll uh, move down to a few of the miscellaneous listed here. Firstly is the uh, rescue team on ground to attend the calls immediately. What is happening is uh, we have a heli evacuation system in place. We have a medical evacuation system in place, but uh, the ground zero reality to attend uh, the uh, casualty. Uh, we require uh, trained professionals who can um, find their way through uh, thick of snow in, in the worst of the climates so that the evacuation can be immediately attend. That is one. Then a proper medical setup, uh, because if there is a delay in any heli evacuation, the patient or uh, should be addressed immediately with the bare minimum medical facilities. So these are very, uh, I would say, resource consuming uh, setups, which would be required uh, for any base camp to come up for a project like this coming up into, uh, in, into a high altitude area. Then we need specialized equipments. Like in one of the photographs, I could see that um, all-terrain vehicle was being used. Now, what is happening is since the entire area is like this, and for that complete year, uh, complete year out of uh, 12 months, almost six to eight months, we'll face snow. So we require uh, the dependency on, I would say, uh, on the all-terrain vehicles becomes very heavy, and uh, we should be well versed with the um, uh, the equipments, uh, the the uh, the drivers who are specialized to drive these equipments in, in a uh, terrain or in snows like this uh, more dependency on track vehicle rather than on wheeled vehicles so these are all points which would um, which would increase the cost and resource of anyone who is um, being a part of uh, a project in a high altitude area that is one then training of evacuation that is very important because what is happening is uh, 
uh, whatever uh, uh, the set of uh, people or the set of specialists there are on ground, they uh, they they need to be well versed with the situation or the eventualities which would arise in any case, so that they are um, any time ready to attend all these issues and can bring out the help within themselves. Then the last point here is the specialized clothing. Uh, we need to work in a high altitude area. Uh, now, uh, clothing is very important uh, because uh, until uh, unless the uh, people are comfortable, <coughs> they won't bring maximum efficiency. So um, uh, this is again uh, becomes very important to provide them the correct set of clothing and the equipment to work in a high altitude area where we have a lot of snow and less of oxygen around. Plus, uh, the connectivity to the mainland is uh, difficult. So these things are very important. Uh, Sandeep, I'll request for the next slide, please. Uh, now, uh, as as I uh, as as Border Road Organization is also taking care of uh, the Atal Tunnel project, which is, as we all know, is the uh, highest tunnel to be built uh, at a height of ten thousand feet, uh, and it is the longest tunnel. It holds the record for the longest tunnel at that particular height. Uh, so I'll bring down a few points from uh, the project, uh, the experiences which I've faced because it's, it itself is in uh, uh, the kind of a high altitude area where we had a lot of issues uh, as far the tunnel is concerned. Next slide, please. Okay, fine. Um, we had issues like uh, since... It it is East Peer Panjal ranges uh, in the areas when the construction was on, uh, the shredded and fractured rock was one of the major uh, impediments in the construction. Uh, specialized uh, focus has to be laid on these issues to address these, uh, these particular areas. We had uh, an issue of high overburden uh, during this project where approximately around 780 meters from the south portal the it, it, it needed a, um, a dedicated effort as for the designing is concerned then uh, the large cross section area north portal inaccessible for six months a year this was the most challenging part because uh, what was happening there was two attack points uh, one of the attack points was almost defunct in winters uh, whereas uh, we were only able to address the tunnel from one 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 point that is south portal, then sort of squeezing happening inside the through the tunnel, and one rock burst incident happened in the tunnel. But fortunately, there was no fatal uh, incident um, uh, as far the rock burst is concerned. Uh, next slide, please. So these are the few photographs where we can see uh, the first photograph uh, clearly depicts the area which uh, has gone through a rock burst incident. And the entire area was redone again. Uh, it was repaired completely. And uh, this uh, took a lot of time. Basically, uh, it, it took uh, time to get the rectification done, which increased the overall time frame of the project, which was unforeseen event, contingency, uh, not planned exactly, but then addressed uh, well within the minimum time frame. Next slide, please. All right. Uh, there, there was a particular case of Sirinala fault zone, uh, which was addressed uh, during the construction of Rotang Tunnel. Sirinala was a fault zone where when the excavation phase reached fault zone, which was around uh, 2.5 kilometers from uh, the south portal, suddenly a lot of muck and water started gushing out, out of the main phase to a tune of 8,000 liters per minute. The entire work was halted uh, and we had absolutely no idea what to do. So these are kind of uh, uh, the the uh, events uh, or, or unforeseen event uh, which was faced during the construction process. Then eventuality, a lot of study has gone, a lot of uh, effort uh, in terms of manpower and resources. Finally, we were able to over, but yes, it extended the construction period uh, uh, to a very large extent, which in fact has uh, affected the entire project. Uh, can we have next slide, please? All right. Uh, as we all know, um, the Rotang Tunnel, uh, uh, the, the portals uh, which has come up, uh, the area also required uh, 
stabilization uh, of the south and the north portal now uh, with the tunnel coming up the challenges faced uh, we have uh, we are moving ahead uh, with uh, the shinkula tunnel project coming and um, gearing ourselves for the project because the, that is going on to a level plus uh, here the height address was uh, 3500 meters which gave us a little stint of what is uh, all about working in a high altitude area uh, now we are addressing uh, the shinkula tunnel project with which we are working at a level of 4500 meters to 5500 meters which is extreme of any high altitude area uh, a lot of snow uh, and very minimum of working uh, period are uh, available to us throughout the year so uh, it would be more challenging uh, and the level of difficulties would be the same nature uh, i would say increase exponentially so um, we are planning in such a manner uh, and uh, as a team uh, we are all uh, giving uh, dedicated uh, effort and time uh, to all these challenges and uh, devising ways and means to streamline uh, each and every factor of it so that the efficiency is the maximum and together able to meet the targets in time we have the next slide please all right so uh, with this uh, uh, we come to the end of the presentation and i would like to take this opportunity to specially thank uh, TAIYM and uh, DTSYM, uh, all the speakers and myself. We are really grateful that you have provided us with such a uh, excellent platform, a forum where all the eminent uh, speakers uh, and all, um, I would say, prestigious listeners are there and to share our experience with them, which would not only increase uh, the um, uh, I would say the uh, the experience all over around, but also would add up to the quality uh, of the work which we are already uh, trying to get out of uh, uh, the various teams uh, coming together for tunneling. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, uh, we are really grateful that um, we share this platform, and hope this presentation adds up to the um, experience part of everyone and. Uh, uh, if anything uh, comes up, we are more than eager to share our uh, uh, solutions on ground with anyone who requires any further details. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for the very kind words, uh, Sade. Um, I mean, it was more you guys and you guys sharing your knowledge, which was beneficial. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was definitely a great presentation. It just added on to uh, the list of um, other good presentations we've had. So thanks a lot for that. Um, and of course, thanks are in order to uh, to the remaining uh, TIYM for actually uh, helping uh, both the audience and the BTSYM uh, get in touch with you guys um, to listen to the experience you were sharing. Um, so we've got, I think, I believe you've got a few questions on YouTube. Um, so, Ayush, is it fine if I read them out, or would you like to drag them towards the the speakers? Definitely, definitely, you can you can uh, go ahead with this, Vivek. Uh, I will join. Fantastic. So the first question we've got is from Chris Presidy, who asks, "How beneficial was the AEM survey, and how?" Did the models, uh, how the models produced from the data, how were the models produced from the data? Shaz, you're on mute, I think. Sir, uh, see, uh, when you are doing AM survey, uh, uh, especially uh, in the very high altitude, the maximum elevation for the helicopter like Chinook uh, can uh, go is uh, 6,000 meters. And uh, 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 we were already, uh, our the peaks of the alignment were already around 5,500, even touching 6,000 meters. So there were certain constraints. Uh, 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 if, uh, especially in AM survey. So, uh, uh, and one of the very uh, challenging thing what the pilots faced were the peaks were very steep, uh, especially in the middle part, uh, in some of the other projects also. 
So uh, in order to get a deep penetration of uh, 600 to 700 meters, uh, you have to maintain that uh, 50 meter gap of the antenna with the ground. So uh, uh, and in that area, the velocity of wind is very high. And uh, uh, in order to go in a straight line, you have to maintain a minimum speed of around 80 kilometers per hour. So if you go uh, less than that, the wind will take helicopters away. And if you go more than that, you're not able to take that particular, uh, 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 maintain that difference uh, uh, of antenna and ground. You have to like take uh, uh, gradually uh, before before the ridges are there. So that uh, 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 that uh, the gap between the antenna and the ground is difficult to get when the ridges are very steep. And especially when you have to take a turn because you cannot climb beyond 6,000 meters, you have to take a turn, you need to get at least two to three kilometers of turning radius. That was also very difficult to get in some of the project. So altogether, what I want to say is like, uh, EM survey was good. We get very good data and uh, we had the inter uh, 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 then various studies and we had uh, uh, compared that data with our uh, other surveys, what we did like uh, ERT and SRT down the line for a better accuracy. And we got decent results. The results were good. Even we had uh, matched that data with uh, our drilling points, the drilling, the bore holes, what we got. And altogether, we, when you make a complete model, longitudinal model, it was good for the project. Fantastic. Thanks for answering that. Yeah. Um, the next question is from Sachin, who asks, so when we speak about Himalayas, we need to factor in the vast permafrost regions there. What are the suggested methodologies to tackle these areas with respect to tunnel and foundations of bridges that may be required? Uh, yeah, uh, very, very nice question. Uh, well, uh, we, we, we do understand uh, that being this being a permafrost region, uh, well, We'll be having a very less window where we don't have snow. Uh, we need to make sure uh, that we do maximum amount of work. I mean, the one specifically below the foundation uh, in in the summers. Uh, usually, before this, all the projects that we used to do were in summers, and then we used to take break in winters, and then come back in summers to do the rest of the work. But since the projects are on very swift timeline, a uh, very short timeline, very, very fast paced. So we, we have to find out the, metal, uh, the, re, the ways to work in that uh, scenario as well. So we need to make sure uh, that we plan things in such a way that substructures are done uh, preferably in summers and then later on building up the superstructures in winters where we can easily access. Uh, then we have to cover the region. It has to be planned in a way that it's covered so that it doesn't get affected by snow, especially the uh, place where we are working. And then we, we manage the logistics and the supply of, of uh, materials around it, as I have already shared in the, uh, in the presentation. So uh, this is how, how things can be done. Um, I know that uh, this is going to be a difficult task. There will be a lot more things to learn when we, when we work in such scenarios. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, that this being a unique experience for India and I think for the world world as well, because I think this is you know, probably the highest uh, tunnel portal in the world for tunnels which is coming up. And there are many more tunnels which are coming up higher than that. So this is going to be a unique experience. There are things that we are still not, we still don't know about which will happen when we are on site. Although a proper planning and methodology will help for sure. Yeah, I mean, the, the way you guys explained it did appear to be quite the challenge, if not one of the most challenging projects we've, we've seen in the industry uh, for a long time. Um, I'm just being mindful of the time here because we've already reached um, the half past two mark here in the UK. So I might just draw the Q&A session to a close here. Um, I know we've missed a few questions, um, but it's just to accommodate the, 
the amount of time people can spend listening to a lecture, especially during the middle of a working day. So I'd once again like to thank all three of you for sharing your experience with us. Um, and hopefully we uh, will have you again in the future, either midway through construction or once the, the construction project uh, is over to, to find out more details about the, the project. Um, and also, yeah, thanking um, Ayush again for, you know, coordinating uh, all of this um, from the Indian side. So, Ayush, uh, would you like to add a few words as well? Yes, yes, Devik, I want to thank uh, Lieutenant Colonel Sunny, Sandeep and Ahmed for this wonderful and challenging presentation uh, uh, showing us the challenges in the Himalayan region. Uh, here, I would also like to thank all the listeners who joined from India and uh, from the Britain. And uh, lastly, I would like to thank you, George, and the whole B B B BTSYM for uh, all the efforts made for making this presentation uh, success. Uh, I would just like to uh, request Devik to share the uh, YTC poster so that uh, we can brief uh, our listeners about the Young Tunneler Conference, uh, which is going to be held in Mumbai uh, on 25th of June uh, this year, we are keeping our finger crossed that uh, COVID will not impact this uh, conference again as it was planned in January. So we have uh, requested everybody for the uh, for their abstract and the presentation. Uh, all the details we will share via mail. Uh, so this is our present uh, poster for this uh, YTC 2022 which is going to be held on 25th of June, 2022 in Mumbai. Uh, the venue details will share uh, via mail and all the details uh, regarding the presentation and abstract will be shared uh, via mail. Uh, so that is that is from my end. Uh, the over to you. Fantastic. Um, I've just recently returned back from India, so I'm not really sure if I could, I, I can attend it. I, I would have loved to attend it, hopefully next year. We will we will wait for you and uh, we'll wait for our friends from Britain, uh, those who can join this uh, conference. Fantastic. Well, then talking about conferences, uh, we've got an, a conference coming up as well. So the BTSYM conference is uh, planned uh, for the 20th of May, uh, so hardly any time remaining. Uh, it will take place, it's a day-long event, it will take place at the Institution of Civil Engineers uh, in Westminster in London. The bookings are now open. Um, it's free for any paid BTSYM member to attend. Um, and it's £60 for non-members. But remember, a BTSYM membership is only £42. So do uh, please do uh, think about joining us at the conference. And we shall be um, announcing the presenters lineup um, next, next week. And I've got some really fascinating uh, presentations uh, in mind for the conference. Um, in line with training and, and knowledge, uh, there's also the BTS Tunnel Design and Construction course, um, which is a week-long course at University of Warwick, it's scheduled to play, take place in July. Um, the bookings are now open. You can find more information about the detailed program on the BTS website. And again, you know, bookings are open for anyone, whether they are in UK or even overseas. It does attract um, a good amount of of, of people from overseas so if you are in your early career if you want to know more about soft ground tunneling uh, please do consider um, attending the course so those were the only two announcements from my side uh, so if you can i think uh, bring the proceedings to uh, to a close uh, but once again thanking our speakers uh, for today for sharing their knowledge and again thanking uh, Ayush and the rest of TAIYM for um, collaborating with us.